I'm going to turn the light off for just a sec. Okay. February 7th, and that we're going to host Scott Nelson, who's the author of um, A Nation of Deadbeats, Uncommon, An Uncommon History of America's Financial Disasters, and that'll be at 4 o'clock here at the Institute. And on March 6th, we're going to host Priscilla Wall from Duke's English Department uh, on Epidemics. Um, she's the author of Contagious, Culture, Carriers, and the Outbreak Narrative. So those are just some of the highlights. Watch our website for events with the working groups and other speakers that we're having. It's going to be a busy season. 
Um, and you're all invited to all of the events. Um, now I would like to introduce Maria Schechtman, who is a professor of philosophy, and she's going to introduce Alex to you. So it is a great pleasure to be able to introduce Alex Arnitzen, who is a graduate student in philosophy, who is just putting the finishing touches on his dissertation. And it's sort of difficult to introduce Alex for the various <coughs> reasons that his work is so interesting and exciting, because it's very difficult to categorize what he does. He works at the intersection of metaphysics, um, ethics, aesthetics, philosophical methodology, and various other areas. And all of this comes together very fruitfully in, his, in the dissertation, where specifically he works on the use of bizarre hypothetical examples um, as a philosophical method in discussing personal identity. And this is a very common method in philosophy and reaches its zenith maybe in the uh, philosophy of personal identity. The method goes sort of like this. You're asked to imagine a bizarre story. You're told a story about some bizarre and impossible thing. You're supposed to make a reaction to it, answer certain questions about what you would say about that case or if that happened which we call, for some reason, intuitions um, about what happens in the case. And then these are used, these intuitions are used in philosophical theory building. So just to give, Alex will go over much of this, I'll try to be brief, but just to give a, a really tame example from the philosophy of personal identity, suppose the ubiquitous evil neurosurgeon comes, takes my brain, puts it in Alex's body so that you now have someone who looks just like Alex but has all of my thoughts, memories, beliefs, commitments, etc., my whole psychological life, and then we're supposed to say, so if that happened, um, what, what goes on with the person in this case? Is this a case, how do we describe this? Is this a case where I have been transplanted into a different body, or is it a case where Alex has been given some rather convincing delusions of being me? And the idea is that if you think the former, if your intuition is the former, that suggests that I am the psychological subject and I go where my psychological life goes. If you think the latter, then you think I am, say, an organism and the organism defines the person and then you use this to build a theory. Now, there are lots of reasons to worry about this method. So somebody who knows something about neuroscience or not, not even, might say, well, how do we know that that's what would happen if you transplanted a brain? Even if we could transplant a brain, why do we think that would be the result? Um, or as these cases get more and more bizarre, you might wonder, well, why, you've, I mean, why even believe that we have real intuitions in these cases? We're told a story, we think something about it. Why take that seriously at all? Or as my intro students like to say, that could never happen, so who cares, <laughs> right? And so this is a legitimate question, and philosophers, believe it or not, worry about this a little bit too, and there is some uneasiness about this method of using cases and of this sort, and those who defend them where they get explicit uh, defense, this method, usually say, well, look to the natural sciences where impossible cases are imagined fruitfully for various reasons. So in physics, you might say, imagine you've got a frictionless inclined plane, or imagine you're running in front of a beam of light, what would you see? These are not things that could actually happen. We all know that, and yet somehow you think it's fruitful to think about them. They can help you clarify something about your theory. And so philosophers say, that's really what we're doing. What we're doing is a thought experiment in everyday life. I'm able to make judgments of personal identity quite easily, but when I do, for instance, psychological and biological continuities usually go together, so I don't know which one is the relevant factor. I'd like to you know, do some kind of controlled experiment. I don't have a way to really do that. So what I do is separate them in thought. I think about a case where right, one occurs without the other and see how I respond to that. And this sounds promising, but there's been a great deal of very effective argument that thought experiments in philosophy can't really function as they do in the natural sciences, that the analogy is a bad one, and really you can't, um, you can't defend them this way. And so people who worry about them say, look, these are really just stories. Why do we think that stories should tell us anything about the way the world is, or that we can learn anything interesting about ourselves in the world in this way? And this is where Alice comes in and says, stories, yes, but just stories, what do you mean by that? 
people who take literary fiction seriously um, and, you know, in a way that many of us do, believe that you can learn something very important about us and about our world from proper attention to stories of the right sort, to good stories, the right kinds of stories, um, and that we really can learn something by reflecting on stories. And so then the question he asks is, well, obviously philosophy isn't doing quite the same thing literature is, but is there a way, instead of trying to model the use of stories in philosophy on science and scientific thought experiments, to model them instead on the way in which we learn um, something important about ourselves and our, our world from stories and fiction, and hence the cognitive value of fiction and philosophical thought experiments and personal identity. <laughs> Thanks, Mari. Um, now I really feel that some of my brain has been transformed. <laughs> but um, I'll try to... Um, first, I'm very happy to be here. Thank you very much for coming today. And I also would like to thank, of course, the philosophy department, my dissertation committee, my immediate dissertation advisor, Mari Sheffman. <laughs> I have another uh, dissertation advisor, David Hilbert, here. Um, I'd like to thank Colin Klein, David Shoemaker, and John Gibson, uh, the other members of my committee. Uh, and I also would like to thank the Institute for the Humanities and all the fellows who have been very supportive throughout this process. And I'm looking forward to your questions, critiques, devastating objections, and, and so forth. Um, OK, so uh, I will not disappoint the expectation that I should start with a thought experiment, since this is a thought on thought experiment. So uh, I will proceed immediately to follow up on what Maria suggested is one example of thought experiments. And here's another one. All right. Uh, today I'm going to run through sorry. Uh, today I'm going to run through some thought experiments with your personal identity. I hope you find them interesting. You agree to take part in an experiment which involves spending the night in a laboratory. There are a hundred beds in the room and you sleep in the one bed which has master written on it. There are 99 empty beds, all labeled copy, and also with the numbers 1 to 99. And while you were asleep, at some particular point in the night, some scientists take a scan of your whole body, including your brain. The scientists use a scan to create 99 identical copies of you, and these are placed in beds 1 to 99, all while you're still asleep. You are told all this in advance. You agree to the experiment because you're being paid, and because you can go home in the morning without anything being done to you, apart from a non-invasive scan. Seems okay, doesn't it? But when you wake up in the morning, a thought suddenly hits you which makes you too scared to open your eyes. When you went to sleep, you expected to wake up in the master bed, as that's where you went to sleep, and leave the laboratory with more money than when you went in. But there are 99 other people all waking up with exactly the same thoughts as you, as they are identical, or were as recently as last night. What extra knowledge do you now have that they don't, which proves that you are the real you? On the other hand, you went to sleep as you, and have now surely woken up as you. These other people have been created completely separately from you. You would be sure who you were if they hadn't been created, so why should that change now? They have not come into contact with you or contaminated you in any way. You went to sleep and woke up as usual. So should you be confident of waking up in the master bed, or have you only got a 1% chance? Here's a further twist. You good? Or <laughs> this, this could go on. Um, this, is, uh, this is from YouTube, the source of all current knowledge. And, um, um, just a moment. So, um, as Maria said, and as you've just witnessed, uh, uh, here's, here's a typical thought experiment. I won't be using it too much, but I just wanted to give you a flavor of what's going on. The case is clearly fantastic. There is no such scam. There is no master bed. This situation is completely made up. Nevertheless, you know, people find them um, useful in thought experiments and personal identity. Uh, the standard questions of personal identity are about the essential features of what it is to be a person, as opposed to, for example, a human being, about what makes a given person the same over time. For example, if my loved one slips into a persistent vegetative state, is the person she was still there or has the person ceased to be while the human being still remains? Thought experiments like the one you just heard are standard methodology in the philosophy of personal identity. But what are philosophers up to using public funds to make up such crazy stories? By the way, I heard this one 
at the party before. <laughs> Put more politely, one might say that there's a tension in the heart of the method. Presumably, the metaphysical questions about personal identity should be directly connected to the issues of self-expression, self-knowledge, and so on. Moreover, the questions of personal identity are traditionally assumed to be directly tied to the questions of responsibility, compensation, tracking our own survival into the future. So the philosophical questions of personal identity are certainly more than of merely scholastic interest. Now, how exactly are the fantastic cases of copying people, teleportation, dividing into two people, downloading memories into new bodies, and so on, supposed to help us with our deep interest in our identity? As the cases get stranger and stranger, it becomes less clear why anybody serious about the metaphysics of identity should turn to such fanciful storytelling to find answers to some of the most fundamental questions about ourselves. Should we burn the proverbial armchair of philosophical speculation of this kind? Philosophers have wondered about their own, their own method for a long time. Some have argued that the philosophical fantastic cases are analogous to the scientific ones, but the analogy has been criticized. Still, thought experiments are widely used, and some of them are centrally important. We have a controversial method, then, without a clear understanding of how it works. At the same time, the question of learning from literary fiction has been alive and well in aesthetics. I suggest that we should take seriously the idea that understanding learning from fiction can help us understand learning from thought experiments and personal identity. Today I will make uh, the case for this by considering Derek Parfit's case of my division. All right. Uh, so here's a, uh, I want to focus on one of the central cases in personal identity called the fission case. Uh, the case is popularized uh, by, was popularized by Derek Parfit in his book Reasons and Persons, which came out in 1984 and had subsequent editions. In case you're wondering who Parfit is, he's considered to be one of the kind of uh, most significant philosophers of personal identity of the 20th century. And uh, some people make similar claims about his work in ethics as well. Um, in case you're thinking this is sort of, in case you're thinking that this is of no interest to anybody else, the New Yorker magazine has recently had a big piece on Derek Parfit. So, you know, he's making kind of way into more popular culture. All right. So here's Parfit's vision case. Uh, and I will uh, read a quote from his book. My body is fatally injured, as are the brains of my two brothers. My brain is divided, and each half is successfully transplanted into the body of, two, of one of my brothers. Each of the resulting people believes that he's me, seems to remember living my life, has my character, and is in every other respect psychologically continuous with me. And he has a body that is very much like mine. So here's early Parfit, and here are his two, we'll call them fission products. The case has been sufficiently discussed discussed and I will bypass a lot of technical details. For example, I'll grant various assumptions about uh, the visibility of the brain, the technological possibility of this operation, and so on. Um, I want to focus on the methodology, so I will just go directly to those questions. According to Parfit, by considering such a case, we learn two things, what we believe ourselves to be and what we are. All right, so Parfit asks, what happens to me in this kind of story? According to him, we have two options. I'm one, but not the other, and or I'm both. Let's consider each in turn. Am I one of the, uh, am I one of the two, but not the other? Well, no. There is nothing in my relation to one of the people that's not also found in my relation to the other. You know, as as we just saw, we stipulated that they have the same memories, same psychological capacities, and so on. So any preference between the two will be arbitrary. Two, can both of these people be me? No. If they're both me, then they would be identical to the same person, me, and so be one person. If A equals B, and then if A equals C, then B must equal C. But if B were C, then they would be the same thing, because everything is identical to itself only. So two people cannot be one person. Here, for those of you in the audience who, uh, who are not coming from the analytic philosophy training, Philosophers usually distinguish between numerical identity and qualitative similarity. So consider uh, two uh, number eight billiard balls. Each is identical to itself and itself only, but qualitatively similar to the other. Or consider the cheat who plays the hidden deck of qualitatively similar but not identical cards against you and goes home with your money. So that's, that's what's going on here. You can't be both, uh, sorry, the original perfect is not identical, but 
only qualitatively similar to his offshoots. All right, Parthi then asks a different question. Um, how should I regard the operation? Would it preserve what matters in survival? Would fish preserve what matters in survival? Consider the operation in which only one hemisphere is removed, the surgical procedure called hemispherectomy, used in rare cases to treat epilepsy. If the operation is successful, the person supposedly survives. But now suppose we do not discard the second hemisphere, but implant it into the, you know, fantastically implanted into the suitable body. According to Parfit, there is nothing missing in the relation in which I now stand to the second person that secured the judgment of survival in a, in a single case. But then, according to Parfit, it is rational to think that what matters is preserved in the double case. The trouble here is that two people cannot be identical to one, as I just said. Parfit's solution is to say that identity is not what matters in survival, um, or that what we really care about is not identity in the metaphysical sense, but that a psychological stream there's a psychological stream quali qual excuse me, qualitatively similar to mine continues into the future. What matters then is the continuation of the psychological connections between the original and some future person or persons. This conclusion is deeply counterintuitive. According to this argument, none of us have a reason to prefer our own survival to the survival of somebody else who is not identical to us but is appropriately psychologically connected to us. Remember that the later parfits are not the same person, but only qualitatively similar. Additionally, while identity is an absolute relation, either I'm identical to some future person or I'm not, the psychological relations that matter can hold to a degree depending on the strength of the connections. For example, some of my commitments are stronger than others, some of my intentions are strongly endorsed, while others are more like fleeting passions, and so on. In some cases, then, it may be rational for me to care about your survival more than about my own, depending on the strength of the connections between the current experiences that I have and some future experience that you may have. To get the flavor of just how radical Parfit's proposal is, consider what he says about death. While the fact of my death may seem depressing, the reality is only that none of the experiential episodes will be causally connected to my brain and psychologically connected to my present experiential episodes. And, Parfit says, in that free description, my death seems to disappear. So let's think of what just happened. Here's what Parfit did. He started with the intuitive idea that what matters in survival is that there is a person in the future who is identical to me. He then imagined the scenario in which what matters seems to be preserved without identity. And then he concluded that identity is not what matters in survival, suggesting an overhaul of some of our most <coughs> deeply held commitments about persons, the difference between self and other, and so on. This is, of course, a paradigm example of philosophy of a paradigm example of what philosophy is praised for, its ability to critically scrutinize our convictions and show us the light. I suggest that we scrutinize the part of uh, its own thinking. Okay. There are different ways to criticize Parfit's work. Some people have suggested that what he's doing, what he's doing is not even metaphysics. Some people have argued that he has tied what we care about to the wrong question of personal identity. Some people argue that his metaphysical conclusions should not affect our self-understanding, and so on. What I want to do is focus on the methodology. As I said, the fission case is centrally important, so the methodological credentials of something that is deeply connected to our caring about our identity, practical concerns, and so on, uh, should not be taken too lightly. So, uh, as Maria mentioned earlier, there is no agreement about how thought experiments work in personal identity. Some philosophers have suggested that their use in philosophy is analogous to those in science. In science, we hold the background fixed and then we vary some chosen feature of the situation while observing the outcome. This seems to be what, what Parfit is doing. The world of fission is pretty much like our world in relevant respects, except for the possibility of psychological continuity without identity. Assuming the background of our judgments in the single case, we then use the background to argue that nothing is missing in the double case. However, Kathleen Wilkes work and responses to it seem to concede that thought experiments in personal identity do, do not fit the scientific model. So it's no use to point to the successful use of thought experiments in science to justify their use in philosophy. But then how do they work? Are they, if they're not like science, are they mere fictions? 
Now we have to admit that the philosophical thought experiments are strikingly similar to many stories of fantastic transformations present in our culture. Stories of the doubles, head swaps, species boundaries, transgressions, and so on. Fission is a popular mo move in science fiction, and the YouTube case may have reminded some of you of a recent movie, Moon. If you, have, if you haven't seen it, I recommend it. It seems natural then to inquire whether, in addition to being immensely entertaining, such fictions also represent one of the ways in which our culture comes to terms with the fragility of life, change, death, and so on. Literary scholars and philosophers have wondered about the cognitive value of fiction. I think that looking in that direction, we can gain some insights into the connection between knowledge and fiction. We can then bring those insights about the cognitive value of fiction to bear on our understanding of, of the cognitive value of the philosophical thought experiments. So let's look and see whether thinking about learning from fiction can help us think about learning from thought experiments. It will not be an exaggeration to say that many scholars, philosophers included, think that fictional literature has serious claims to knowledge. I would not be surprised to find sympathetic ear to this idea in the audience today. On the other hand, of course, the opposite intuition is also understandable. We don't you regularly ask our undergrads to read science fiction to learn truths about the world. In contrast to science and philosophy that we typically link with knowledge production, literary fiction does not seem to provide arguments or hypotheses about the actual world. It doesn't seem to collect evidence and eliminate alternative explanations of the studied phenomena and so on. How can then fiction link with knowledge? How can it be cognitively significant? One way to explain the cognitive significance of fiction is to provide a philosophical, anthropological, sociological, or whatever else translation of the fictional work that can comfortably traffic in knowledge discourse. Thus, while literary fictions themselves do not claim to represent the actual world, because they are, because they are after all, fictions, the theoretical precipitate can be said to imply or contain propositional and thematic truths or implicit thought experiments and arguments. For example, Noel Carroll, uh, a philosopher of art, argues as follows. Philosophers use thought experiments as tools for conceptual clarification. Thought experiments philosophers use produce knowledge. We can interpret some literary works as implicit thought experiments, so some fiction can give knowledge. And Peter Kiley suggests that fiction's reflective afterlife contains, ref, um, contains thinking about um, truth and falsity of what's being said in, in the literary work. Thus, Anna Karenina is said to show the suffocating conditions of women in Russian high-class society, leave no happy choices for somebody wanting to part with the conventional sex roles, and so on. On the other hand, you might think that, that this proposal, uh, this way of gaining knowledge from the literary works, is overly philosophical. It applies more to what philosophers do with literary work when they try to use it for their own purposes or in support of their own thesis. It is in tension with the intuitive idea that there is something really distinct and valuable about reading literary works as such. Consequently, there is a worry that if we start doing philosophy with them, to them, we may not be in a position to get the cognitive value of engaging directly with the fictional content itself, as opposed to something external to the text, like the argument that we have extracted from it. I take it that such an instrumentalist extraction of bits of fictional content <coughs> from the context that supplies their significance misrepresents the cognitive value of fictional works by presenting it as available without loss outside of the context of the fiction. One of the alternatives to instrumentalism, developed by John Gibson, is the idea that the world that the literary fictions present to us is a living world and not a conceptual object, suggesting that what literary narratives are able to do especially well is take the concepts we bring to our reading of a work and present them back to us as concrete forms of human engagement. The emphasis here should be placed on the work of concretization of the conceptual knowledge embodied in the vision of a fictional world we understand as having value and significance as being an object of human care. According to Gibson, the vision of a world gives life to and exhibits in a dramatic gesture the meaning and significance of our concepts as living dispositions in our responses to the world and to others. Thus, it gives expression to how our cognizing the world needs to be embodied in our orientation to the world shared with others, the world of value. Literary fictions, according to this line of thought, can be seen as inviting us to see how our knowledge can be fulfilled in the following sense. It shows how literary works embody what we know 
by giving more or less life to our knowledge. They show the point and value of having the concepts we do. Let me illustrate this with an example. Consider, however, briefly Kafka's Metamorphosis, one of those stories that are strikingly similar to the fantastic thought experiments that we're discussing. As you recall, a traveling salesman, Gregor Zamza, wakes up in his bed transformed into a gigantic insect-like creature. <coughs> in several dozen pages, we follow the trajectory of his life leading to his eventual death. Arguably, engaging with the story can give us, for example, some insights into the complicated connections between embodiment and psychological dispositions on the one hand, and the social feedback one receives on the other. Kafka's absorbed and detailed descriptions of Gregor's slow adjustment to his new conditions of the loss of the expressive power of the human body in the absence of any social interaction of the familiar and supportive kind make the fantastic vision into a realistic piece by deepening our appreciation of the social aspects of the embodiment that are necessary to sustain the life of a person. Even though, even though it would be a stretch to think that the story implicitly argues for some view about the interaction of such aspects of our existence, the logic of the story of the death of the insect in the family rings true to us. It would be a farce, I think, if Gregor got married at the end of the story and lived happily thereafter. I, I realize, I, sorry, I know that there can and are conflicting readings of this text. In order to be convincing to us, though, they have to be supported by textual evidence and some general assumptions about the intended audience. Does this show that the whole business of linking knowledge with fiction is flawed and that any interpretation is a fair game? I don't think so. There are better and worse readings, and I don't think that the distinction is arbitrary. Um, we can talk about this at the end of the, uh, during the discussion period if you want, but I will mention, I will say some more about this later. Okay, so I can't resolve the dispute between instrumentalism and non-instrumentalism in this talk. For my purposes, it's enough to, to note that both camps agree that the power of literary fictions lies in engaging our understanding with the rich details of the dynamic narrative interactions of persons, concepts, and world. The role of the critic, according to this picture, is to help us see the features of the story that are salient for our understanding some aspects of our lives. Okay. This understanding of the cognitive value of fiction, I now suggest, can be brought to bear on our understanding thought experiments and personal identity, of course with suitable modifications. We can call this a literary model of thought experiments. No heavy weather should be made of the idea of model here. It is certainly not a scientific model. I suggest to consider what we can learn while engaging with, living, with the living world of a thought experimental fiction by reflecting on how the full vision of the fantastic transformation and its impact on the life of a person in the world can illuminate some aspects of the world, the conditions of the lives of persons. I think it is best at this point to put the model to use by revisiting the fission case and then make some general remarks at the end of this. Because I think, you know, it's better if I actually just go ahead and apply it to, to the case instead of being abstract. Okay, so let's review Parfit's argumentation in the fission case. Okay, so if there were only one uh, psychological continuer, we would regard it as survival. But the nature, oh, sorry, if there were only one future continuous standing in the relation in which Parfit now stands to his two offshoots, we would regard it as survival. This is what happens every day. But the nature of my relation to each of the two continuers is exactly the same in, as the nature of my relation to my future self in, ordin in ordinary survival. If one were to argue that division is like death, one can only fault duplication itself. That is, one has to show that the fact of duplication changes the nature of the relation itself. Parfit thinks that this is indefensible. Let's then start by thinking more carefully about the single case. I think if we probe the link between the judgment of survival and the preservation of the psychological continuity, we can put ourselves in a better position to understand our resistance to saying that the division is as good as ordinary survival. Okay, so consider, consider hemispherectomy again. The operation of removing, removing one hemisphere is like amputation. If the consequences for the brain are minor, the individual will reintegrate. This seems unobjectionable. But does it follow from this that what matters here for our judgment of survival is solely the nature of the relation of the individual to his continuum, namely the psychological continuity. 
What are the reasons that in this case the judgment seems unproblematic? I think the judgment depends on a very large number of background conditions we assume without reflection, and on the expectation we have about the outcome of this case. For example, we assume that the removed hemisphere doesn't have some independent status, that its value is contingent on the role that it plays in the life of the survivor and the value we, associ we associate with the continuation of a given life, that the survivor will pick up the thread of life interrupted by the removal of the hemisphere, and so on. These assumptions, among many others, form the background of intelligibility of judgments of survival. Since this shared background is implicit, our discussions tend to focus on the very specific details, while the contribution of the background then may drop out of the consideration and seem not to be playing the role that it actually plays. So let's apply this to the double case. As I have just indicated, our judgments of survival presuppose an implicit stable background that makes our pronouncements in difficult cases intelligible. This background of intelligibility is essentially a kind of an extended narrative that our culture can tell about the world the conditions of a person's continuation. What we have to do then is tell a story of the life of the fission products in order to tap into the resources of intelligibility of our judgments of survival. This is the link with the earlier discussion of the literary fictions. Such fictional development of the bare and abstract philosophical scenario will give us some useful insights. So let's start by thinking about what Parfit himself says about the influence of the outcome of vision on our relation with others. Parfit says that the woman who loves him will love two Parfits, but won't be able to give each her undivided attention. I think this is a bit too optimistic for Parfit. <laughs> First, if the notion of love is tied to the absolute uniqueness of the loved one, we may wonder if vision would have a more destructive effect on, the, on this notion compromising Parfit's use of it in his discussion. But suppose you think this is too romantic. Then consider marriage, children, inheritance, family dynamics, dissertation writing, and so on. And what happens to any of these institutions and arrangements when fission occurs? For example, suppose your husband undergoes fission. When both of these fission products come home to their wife and children, what exactly happens to each of them in the family? Do they both eat the family dinner, pass the salt, take kids to school, do they divide their duties? And whom should the kids turn to for advice? How do they keep track of who is doing what? What about the wife? And so on. It is clear that with respect to some of the resources of life, division, of po division is possible between two equally qualified competitors. Money and, other qu sorry. Money and other quantifiable possessions can be divided. However, when we think of long-term projects and, and processes that constitute a typical life, like bringing up children, maintaining friendships, writing dissertations, books, pieces of music, all that stuff that, that is required to build a life together and among others, we are confused when we try to frame them as divisible. It is more likely that the personal relationships will be significantly transformed or even break down, dissertations will be stalled, families separated, and so on. Notice, though, that most of the stuff of life that matters is in fact like that and not like the divisible, divisible material possessions. It comes as no surprise then that often in the fictional stories that attempt to come up with some coherent story about the doubling of this kind, one of the products heroically expunges himself from any connection to the business of living the same life, or he dies. Um, I, I don't expect anyone to have watched The Sixth Day, but this is what happens uh, in the sixth day, so if you're curious how this happens, if you have two, um, kind of two competitors for one thread of life, one of them heroically leaves and goes somewhere away and never comes back. This brute solution, oh, sorry, this brute force solution, we must admit, is some way to go about the situation. But as Susan Wolf points out, there are reasons to regret it. Being completely severed from the life one led up to, up to now is traumatic, and it is not clear whether many will find the psychological strength to keep the distance. We should also not forget about the damage to the person who stays behind to pick up where the original left off. His knowledge of their being an outcast may in itself be rather disturbing and have dramatic consequences. At any rate, it is an open question what psychological changes follow the realization that there is another competitor for your resources out there. In general, Thinking of ourselves as persons who must live among others with particular historical trajectories that are recognizable and identifiable over time presupposes a stable unit about which various practical concerns like those I described arise. My questions about the 
dividing husband and father were intended to reveal the social dimensions of the crisis when this presupposition is threatened by fission. Let me belabor the point that many philosophers have thought that Parfit's conclusion is a reductio ad absurdum. Without identity, why should I care that there will be something, somebody who is exactly like but not identical to me, who will be qualitatively similar, who will have qualitatively similar beliefs, projects, and so on? Again, it is important to ask what, the, what this very natural idea of mattering or caring about something presupposes. And understanding the notion leads to thinking about the lives of persons in the world. Caring for oneself or another person, for example, presupposes stable practices of re-identification. In caring, among other things, we have to imagine and anticipate our own future, align it with that of others. If splitting became available and actualizable, I think we may not be able to apply our current notion of mattering or caring to these fantastic possibilities. For example, how could I choose between promoting this or that future when I could have different futures and could have them several times? Should I care about this mother or that one? Can I care for both as mothers? What kind of, interaction, what kind of intentions do I have to build into this kind of life? An engaged reflection about these issues will significantly compromise Parfit's conclusion from his abstract vision case. I don't think this is simply a failure of imagination that precludes us from answering these questions before the story breaks down and loses its interest as a story about us. This failure points to something important. Contemplating the possible outcomes of fission, we get to the core of our self-understanding by revealing the assumptions about the cluster of features involving the conceptions of persons, their lives, the world they live in, and their relation to it, which we cannot give up without becoming unintelligible to ourselves. Thus, the difficulties we encounter in our attempts to tell the stories of vision survivors bring to the surface the tension between the imagined scenario and the vocabulary we are asked to apply to it. While Parfit can say that the division is further away from death than ordinary survival, we don't yet understand how to hook this up with the rest of our lives, or how to assess what hangs on this without the rest of the picture which requires the constructive filling in that I just described. In sum, if we perform the task of filling in the rest of the fictional world of fission, we will uncover different features that compromise our ability to understand what Parfit's imaginative scenario comes to for persons like us, because once the story gets off the ground, we cannot both rely on the assumptions that make our talk of persons intelligible and at the same time undo those assumptions. So Parfit's case does not show that identity is not what matters in survival, because we don't know yet how to understand because we don't yet understand the place of persons as we know them in the world of fission. Okay. Let me make three general remarks to avoid uh, a possible misunderstanding of the proposal. Uh, so the proposal is, we put the fantastic in the dynamic interaction with the background we are telling the story, and what we get are the insights into the complicated relations between different aspects of personal identity. So, the proposal is not to replace thought experiments with literary fiction. So I'm not asking to swap the English department with the philosophy department or vice versa. We're not borrowing the content of the fictions, but only an appreciation of the importance of dynamic interactions between the imagined change and the social physical environment of the person. In the philosophical context, I suggest to reflectively engage with further details of the interaction between the background and the fantastic transformation. So it's a methodological proposal. Two, there is a change in the question that we are after. The fission case, as originally, as originally proposed by Parfit, was supposed to address the question, what happens to me and what is the rational response to the case? Our intuitive reaction to thought experiments are standardly taken to offer support for this or that theory of personal identity. Detailed reflections on the interaction between the suggested transformation like fission or teleportation in the surrounding world are either assumed to be irrelevant, insignificant, or secondary. Instead, I put reflections on such worldly conditions at the heart of the matter. According to my model, the question is whether the scenario described here is at all coherent. And we're trying to address this question by reflecting on the possibilities of persons' lives in the possible world under consideration. The questions I want to ask is, 
is the world described here conceptual and materially similar to the world of our form of life? What transformations seem comprehensible to us and what don't, and so on. Now, what do we get out of this kind of reflexive exercise? Did I say reflexive? Reflective exercise. Prophet's question was whether it was rational to think that division is like death. My analysis shows that before addressing this question, we need to be able to understand the background world of fission. If the imagined world gives us a coherent extension of our practices, then reflecting on the case will be helpful to understand the interaction between the clusters of features that make our lives possible in such worlds as lives of persons. But if our discussion of this question is of excuse me, but if our discussion of this question of coherence and consistency leads to significant difficulties or resolves in, in a disagreement, then it is a sign that the case may not be able to help us address the question at hand, or alternatively, that we may have to live with a disagreement about some question about personal identity. Either way, by reflecting on by reflecting on thought experiments in the manner that I am suggesting, we may gain a more nuanced understanding of the conditions under which persons can continue to exist. Trying to tell trying to tell the story of fission survivors, we came to a halt. This shows, I think, the centrality of the uniqueness of the psychological continuum in our thinking. Three, to address the new questions. We have to fill in the background details and to think about the dynamic interactions between the fantastic feature and the background. So the import of standard cases, which are better and abstract, may have to be criticized and rethought. But part of the interest in engaging with thought experiments lies in, their, in, the, in these further clarifications and explanations. At any rate, this is not too much to ask, I think, since philosophical thought experiments do not exist in abstraction from other thoughts of their readers because imagining such cases is not independent of the practical context of our lives. It is no loss, then, to propose further fiction and thought experiments by adding more details of the background world to the existing scenario. Okay, so, roughly, additional details of such world-making, elaborating the thought experiments, are supposed to help us examine clusters of features of our lives that have to be presupposed when we discuss questions of personal identity. By imagining the practical context of the fantastic transform transformations, we envision possibilities of our form of life being able to incorporate the imagined change and sustain it. Using thought experiments in this way, we're pro probing the sustainability of our concepts in the newly envisioned circumstances, so that we are in a position to pose the questions about identity over time in the first place. Such probings are defeasible, and I'm not arguing that we can be certain that we're not simply being misguided by the thought experimental fictions that we craft. But I believe that if the informed discussion of these cases can withstand informed criticisms, this kind of coherentist justification is enough to get us going. So to conclude, philosophers are often accused of <laughs> philosophers are often accused of unsupported speculations from the armchair. Some suggest that we seriously consider abandoning speculative exercises in favor of going to the lab or conducting surveys and burning the proverbial armchair. In part, this may have to do with the fact that such speculation do not fit the scientific model of success. I suggested a different way of thinking about philosophical thought experiments. I'm not sure that we can keep the armchair for good, but hope that we can postpone the fires. <laughs> Thanks. Questions? <laughs> so let's hear. Yes, I'm here. Uh, I'm not from the philosophy department, so I will come up with a brief. Why on you? <laughs> uh, when I heard you asking, um, to what extent literary fictions can teach us something about the world, about us, about truth, and stuff, I was thinking that perhaps your approach would be something similar to what historians such as Keith Thomas would come up with, which is uh, analyzing the stories that people told to themselves in the past. And to think about those, those particular stories of the current fiction as telling something about the anxieties, concerns, or goals that people had in the past. So in that sense, I was wondering why is that, um, why is that it is not feasible or perhaps desirable to come up with a history of thought experiments? A little bit like that. Uh, why is that particular uh, stories have more currency, more value, or more revered over and over over time, and others 
are discarded. Why is that? Um, it is not possible to get out of some experiments to discuss the validity of some experiments. A little like when you were talking about this could be going on, this, this, this would continue, could continue on and on, you know, when you're talking about the YouTube. And then you were discussing about the case of Perfit's uh, wife. And in order to uh, develop the implications of the experiment, you need to come up with another experiment. And, and you need to continue along the, that line. So I was thinking, is there a way to get out of that moment and then say what this thought experiment is actually about? About society, about the particular historical context of society in which Parvik was able to come up with this kind of work. And why did somebody didn't do it in the past, in the 17th century, 18th century? Well, well, actually, I mean, what's interesting is that, well, first, thought experiments of kind of fantastic kind are prevalent throughout the history of philosophy going all the way back to Plato and earlier. And specifically the case of division is, as far as I know, I think this is either the 17th or the 18th century, um, there's a philosopher, Hazlitt, who suggests the kinds of thought experiments that Parfit, I mean, Parfit is coming up with those independently, I think, but at least he doesn't cite Hazlitt. But Hazlitt talks about this kind of stuff back then, and John Locke talks about sort of the prince, the famous case of the prince and the cobbler, where the soul of the prince is um, enters and informs the body of the cobbler, and we all say that the person, the prince, now has a new body. So, so in fact, I mean, so I mean, I, I, I very much like the suggestion of thinking of whether the history of thought experiments and some, you know, kind of recurring theme survives our reflection or keeps bugging us enough. Um, but I guess we would have to look in more detail about which ones have continued or which ones haven't. Does that does that does that help? But it, I, I thought there was more of a question about how do we get. The one about we can keep going on and on, but how do we get out? Where do we stop? Was that a different question? Or? No, that was another. <laughs> okay, okay, I'll come. I'll come back to this. Yeah. Oh, Jeff. Yes. Thanks. I thought it was a really interesting talk. I, I had uh, two questions about it. One is if you're, you're looking to literature, I, I wonder are there, are you learning from literary theorists uh, how they think about storytelling, or are you using kind of a common sense notion of sto stories? I, I, I wasn't sure whether you, you, you actually are doing a kind of interdisciplinary work in that sense. Um, and the, the, the second is, um, uh, I, I was wondering about, um, kind of follows on the previous question, whether thought experiments are um, a object of philosophizing, not just a method of philosophizing. So, in, in a way, so that there the analogy might be like uh, with dreams, as opposed to the analogy with stories. That, um, the interest in thought experiments would be what, um, why that's one way that we work on problems mm -hmm. to, to understand what, what, why there's such a powerful appeal, even if we think it's logically faulty to do it, why an attempt to say intuitively we're, we're um, drawn to do it anyway. Okay, thanks. Uh, let me try to say something about each. Um, so when I, um, I suppose my interdisciplinary bend is that I'm looking at the literature in aesthetics and connecting it to the metaphysics literature in kind of an unfamiliar way. So I'm reading philosophers who are reading, I mean, I've, I've read some literary critics, but mostly I relied on philosophical work in philosophy of art and aesthetics. And uh, so in this kind of, I, in this indirect way, I have been engaging with what the literary scholars are talking about. Um, so. But I think your question maybe goes deeper is, in fact, am I, and, and this, this came up, this is not as if I, this, this came up during my dissertation presentation, 
um, am I really doing what I say I'm doing? Why am I calling this a literary model? I may as well have said something like, look, it's a narrative model or story model or common sense background development model or holistic model or something like that. Uh, I think this is kind of an interesting this is an interesting question, and then one, one way to approach it is maybe to think, well, what are literary scholars doing themselves when they say that they're learning from fiction? It may be that what they're relying on is some kind of psychological understanding of what narrative is. So I, I have yet to resolve this, this problem because I, I do feel like there's a little bit of a tension between calling this a literary model, but then only using it methodologically as if instrumentally. Um, I don't think that's too big of a problem from my view because I think I am kind of relying on storytelling as a way to um, a way to understand how the breakdown of such stories shows something about our condition. Um, but but I appreciate that, that question and um, I think this is kind of the place where I need to do a lot of work. Oh. Second, <laughs> Are thought experiments an object of philosophical study? Yes, um, <laughs> but I'm not doing it here, so I'm just discussing it as a method. The, there is a significant research done on kind of empirical psychology of imagination. Um, then uh, there is a reason I placed the armchair on the flyer and said, do not burn, and I kept referring to the armchair. I'm not sure if it came through, but uh, recently um, there has been kind of this... Recent, some philosophers have joined what they have called the x fi or experimental philosophy, and so what they're doing is that they're, instead of relying on their own imaginations, they're conducting surveys among undergrads, and they give them the scenarios like those we just talked about. And what they're doing is they're trying to understand what, uh, whether what Parfit says is, is in fact what undergrads would say. And they try to quantify it and, you know, 50% of people living in such conditions would say this and this. Some of them will not. And so there is a kind of empirical, empirical investigation going into um, thought experiments of this kind. Um, I'm not dealing with this here, but but uh, I think I think this is an, an interesting question, and I think I should connect eventually my research to this. Um, as for why do they have such an appeal? Well, I, I think I think there's something really kind of important about the possibility of transcending our limits that's going on here, and I think this is kind of what drives philosophers. Um, criticizing and revising our concepts. And I think thought experiments are kind of a useful challenge to kind of overcome a certain kind of conservatism of language, of our ideas, and so on. So I think they do have this intuitive appeal to us. Does that, does that help? Okay, Dave, please. So, so something has gone wrong according to you in Harvard's use of things like this fishing example to establish uh, a philosophical conclusion that, that it's, you often kind of use a shorthand for the worrisome kind of uh, a hypothetical example that it's fantastic. Right? But, but of course, many of the stories people tell to illuminate important truths are fantastic. Think about, like, I was trying to think of one, so like, I don't have a Imagination. So I thought of the fox and the grapes, and we, we have a talking fox. But but actually, uh, I, I remember actually being puzzled with this when I was young. We, we have a fox that wants to eat grapes. <laughs> it's, a hung, it's a hungry fox, obviously. Uh, and, so, and so somehow this uh, uh, vegetarian speaking fox is supposed to teach us some important truth about yeah. uh, rationalizing our desires or exactly what, what the moral is. And, and moreover, it does seem to do that quite successfully, in spite of the fact that this, of course, it has nothing to do with anything, at least superficially in our experience. It seems just as fantastic as, 
any of this philosophical story. So, I mean, so yeah, this, this, the, the, the question, I guess, is this, could you comment? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I, I, is it Aesop? Is it Aesop's fables, right? Yeah. Um, so I think, I think this may be related to the question of, kind of there are genres of these things, right? And some of them are using um, some of them would appeal to something that doesn't exist like a fox a grape craving fox to exemplify some kind of a I don't know a moral in a story so I think you know this case could be could be classified as kind of a metaphoric reflection on a particular aspect of um, kind of common norms common mores or something like that I don't think Parfit's case is like that because, I mean, it, it's not as if it's a metaphor. I mean, at least I don't. I mean, at least I don't think so. If it were a metaphor, we, we wouldn't be discussing it in this case. I think what he is trying to say is that this isn't. This is metaphysically possible, and therefore, um, this shows something important about ourselves. I don't think Aesop was kind of concerned about the same issue. So. So I would I would think that in some cases we can say yes, um, it, it's a metaphor and so it's an illustration of a particular point and it doesn't have to stick to a real representation. I mean it doesn't have to kind of be confined to what happens in the world. Whereas in this case I think I think he's doing something different. So, so the idea is that fantasticness is only a problem if you're doing metaphysics or. Well, I mean, it's it's it becomes. I mean, yeah. I mean, I think I think when I use fantastic as a shorthand, it comes it comes with this kind of background. It's it's a problem if we are trying to use it to discuss metaphysical issues based like that. This sort of seems to me that the, the fantasticality of the fox and grapes is irrelevant almost to the moral. You can tell the same story with a person saying the grapes. It would be a more boring story. Trying to get the kids more. to listen. Mm -hmm. but the perfect <laughs> example is it's essential to the case. You couldn't remove the fantasticality and still keep what's interesting about it. That's. I mean, I, I guess the, the. Yes, thanks. That's that. That helps. But I think I'm saying something similar because I'm saying, look, in this case, the metaphor. Uh, we understand the the rules of the game of talking about the. Uh, the fox and the grapes, because we're talking about morals disguisedly or something. But here we're, I mean, we're not talking about any kind of metaphor. <coughs> At least not, I mean, so do you think, do you think I'm, I'm agreeing with you or disagreeing? No, I think you're agreeing. Okay, okay. <laughs> okay, because I, I lost track of it. For, for a second I thought that, you know, the more you talk, the, you know, you could really get into trouble. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks, thanks for that. You uh, well, I think that the research project is fascinating. And I have realized philosophers are doing much more interesting projects than uh, the social scientists. Yes, and also more difficult to understand. So actually, I, I don't agree, but fine. Yeah, so actually, I, I have a question. Uh, well, maybe I didn't really understand the project. So if so, please forgive me. Um, it, it seems to me uh, this question about uh, identity and personality is more at the individual level. Um, but uh, so actually my reaction was, uh, uh, to what extent uh, can your finding or some other theories be applied to collective identity or you know, the, the group identity or even you know, to a larger extent about national identity? Uh, so can we extend our, you know, our knowledge from European about the personal identity to, to, to some identity at a higher level? Thanks. That's, that's good, thank you. Um, another chapter <laughs> <laughs> that I haven't written. <laughs> uh, uh, let me, um. So maybe because I'm a, a political scientist, so actually when I see your project, especially when I see the title, um, Identity. The first thing that came to my mind is national identity, mm -hmm. and there's a lots of literature in political science. People are talking about how we mm -hmm. form national identity, and some people argue, you know, the idea of nationality is actually totally uh, socially constructed. Mm -hmm. Or to put it in another way, 
it's totally man-made, or we don't know who we are um, until we see a different people. Mm -hmm. So I, I sort of see the connection between your study and this kind of discussion, but you know, maybe it's totally irrelevant. Um. This is, um, I mean, I'm, I'm certainly out of my depth here, and so what I'm discussing is identity as Anglo-American kind of school of philosophy understands, understands answers to questions like, what are the necessary and sufficient features of being a person, like, let's say, consciousness or language possession or something like that. And the other question, what makes um, one person at an earlier time the same person as um, the later person at a different time? And so, um, so I think, um, um, so <laughs> I'm trying to say that, yes, I can see the connection, but I can't quite kind of express what I think about it yet because, you know, I really haven't thought about it for a while. But um, how does this connect to national identity? Does anyone else in the audience want to want to kind of jump in because I am uh, blanking, obviously? Oh. oh, no, 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 no. This is, this is great because I mean, because I, I can learn more than I can... Maybe Mari? Did you, did you want to say did you? Yeah, um, I had a kind of related question um, to this, which may help or may not, I don't know. But it, and it may be so basic to the discourse about personal identity that it's not actually relevant. But it seems to me that all those thought experiments that you've suggested um, presuppose a very a, a sort of you you are you are in your head. I mean, it's just an individual, not a social being. And then you're arguing, it seemed to me, for more background detail. You're saying in these experiments, we need to know what's going to happen to the wife and what's going to happen to the kids and what's going to happen to the people. So, in a way, you are suggesting, in fact, that the person. The identity of the person is created not just in the single person, but as a social process. So I don't know if that's, it, it, I think it's similar to what you're asking. So, so yeah, is okay. the basic assumption then, um, you know, that we are just always kind of, you know, individuals walking around, or are you actually moving towards some kind of idea that identity, personal identity, is forged? Mm -hmm. created actually in a process outside of itself. Mm -hmm. Thanks. I think that that may be kind of a the first step in that direction. <laughs> and um, thank you for this. I mean, this this is kind of a useful observation. But in general, you know, you blank, and then somebody tells you what you're thinking. And <laughs> you think, yes, that's that's the way to do it. Um, um, yeah, and I think what 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 you are talking about is kind of some kind of a the further reflection of how these kind of very basic social processes can then be translated into the ideas of collective identity and national identity. But I think I was talking about something slightly more basic than, than the collective and national identity that, as discussed in social sciences and, and political science. So I'm thinking more of kind of the very basic interactive level of human animals um, and what those conditions look like. And then I think the collective identity and national identity is um, kind of a further further abstraction. There is there is a connection, but I, I can't quite work it out right now. Do, um, Maria, do you want to? So, so this is, I'm going to ask you a question, because I'm you <laughs> that, that um, maybe tries to pull some of the other questions together. Uh, okay. Because I think we have an answer to this has been for me back to Dave's question in a way, because um, in response to Dave's question, I think, you know, you rightly said, and it was very helpful when, when Dave further said, you know, look how essential to the story is the fantasticality. Mm -hmm. but, but your answer 
I think fudged a little because you said, well, but what PERFIT is doing with it is something else, which is certainly true. Mm -hmm. But the question is, is what you're doing with it something else? So I mean, I think it's still fair to say, look, PERFIT wants to use thought experiments in this way, and if you're using them in the way he thinks he's using them, then, it, then fantasticality is a problem. Mm -hmm. um, but then you're sort of in the middle because it seems like, you know, your answer to these questions, I think, really is, well, we'll look, yeah, I'm talking about identity, but the word identity gets used a lot of different ways. And there's this logical notion of identity that, you know, when you were talking about numerical identity before, is it one thing or is it more than one thing? which is distinct from national identity because you need to know what thing you're talking about when you ask how its national identity gets formed, right? Mm -hmm. And you're trying to just individuate a single thing. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, right, I think that what your project is doing, and this is the, the part that just came in, is saying, well, maybe these two senses of identity can't be kept so entirely distinct, maybe in the case of being like us, the individuation is tied into these other things, right? Um, mm -hmm. In this way, and then, um, then I guess the question that I'm coming back to, in a way, is: so, what question now is your use of thought experiments <laughs> answering? And how much is it like Parfit's question, and how much of it is more of a, you know, so, so how much of what we're learning is something like an answer to Parfit's question, and how much of it now is shaded over into the kind of thing you can learn by talking about the box and the grapes or something? Does that? Is yeah. That a very well question? Yeah. <laughs> it was, um... It's impossible to answer, but anything you can answer. <laughs> <laughs> if it's impossible, well, that's it. Yeah, you have to say uh, Yeah, I mean, I was hoping to just remain at the methodological level, but I think the questions that I'm hearing suggest that I can't do that anymore, and so my work is more, it's much more difficult now. <laughs> um, I, I think um, admitting the role of social relations and kind of the physical background gets me into more of a kind of less of a metaphysician's metaphysician like Parfit, that there's a thing, then it has relations, this can be kept separate and discussed. I think what I'm getting into something, some, as you said, shaded area or kind of fuzzy gray area of between something like a thing, but that is always practically immer immer uh, immersed. So um, that's kind of as good as I can as well as I can do right now, and I think um, that's something to take forward into the future to think about, you know, exactly what my method is doing in terms of kind of substantive proposal about what question of identity I'm asking. Mm -hmm. um, yes, Natasha. Hey, th th this is a, a great talk, and I have lots of things flowing through my head. Um, as a literary scholar, I'm really interested in you know, how you were going to bridge this philosophy, philosophy, not just philosophy and literature, but the types of questions you're asking. And I think um, that's what you're saying is, you know, make, makes your work exciting, but also sort of difficult to parse through because literature, you know, certainly when we think of literary scholarship in the last 20 years, you know, we we think of literature as such an embedded and social act that, you know, one can talk about the politics of Aesop, why analogy or fable was important, or, you know, I have a friend who's working on Shakespeare and analogy because as a way to comment in a politically repressive period, an analogy or history becomes the genre of choice in, in, in those kinds of social environments. But I don't want to give you questions that you can't answer. Can you just clarify, though, what kind of crisis in your discipline is, 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 is that, that my sense is there is some, crisis maybe too large a word, there is some kind of, <laughs> 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 there is 
We should connect. What's going on in philosophy that's yeah, making? Or, you know, yeah, what, what? yeah, um, is, is the word crisis suggested because... Uh, it, <laughs> well, well, I mean, I think uh, s there has been a lot of reflection about this method of thought experiments. And as I, as I said earlier, you know, a lot of people are trying to understand what exactly um, you know, is there any uh, kind of empirical validation for how we conduct those thought experiments, what we get out of them, and so on. So philosophers have been kind of much more reflective about their own ways, and some people have gone all the way to the empirical psychology, and yeah, they're yeah, doing... That, that was interesting to me. So, so, but, I mean, my my own coming to this was... I mean, it, it's not as if I was in a particular crisis, but I, I really sort of w was gripped by the argument, and I knew that there was something wrong with it, but I couldn't quite put together what was missing. And so, um, so it wasn't as if there was a disciplinary crisis, but there is, in, in the philosophy of personal identity at least, there is a lot of kind of recent reflection on methodology and trying to understand what kind of questions of identity have been asked. So, for example, between Parfit's 1984 and 2012, um, lots of proposals have been made about kind of how different questions of personal identity have been misconceived, uh, that there isn't a single one that um, uh, we should pay much more attention to how our starting points and such philosophizing and so on. So I think my project is in line with a lot of such work. Yeah. It's just I, I, I was doing it sort of from the methodological perspective. But the, there is a, there's always a crisis in philosophy. <laughs> <laughs> there's, I mean, so so, so it's, it's kind of like mentioning it, you know, it's like, yeah, of course there's a crisis. <laughs> uh, I, I mean, it, that's our permanent condition. Uh, um, Dave, and then uh, I, I'm not sure. I'll, I'll, I'll pass. Okay, go ahead. Uh, uh, Gregor sounds uh, uh, transformed into the Unconceifer uh, in, in a short period of time. Uh, the portrait of Dorian Gray transformed over a long period of time. It, it would seem that uh, what, you, what, you're, uh, what this uh, involves is more like the conservation of self-identity, uh, you know, despite the vicissitudes of life, you know, through both acute and uh, chronic, you know, challenges to uh, maintain one's self-identity. Um, was that a question, or? <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> so. I, I'm, I'm interested if that in any way is consistent with, with what, what do you think your the, the thesis is about? Um, could, could you say again, I'm, I'm sorry, could you say again, sort of, I mean, so Gregor Samsa's change was dramatic and I mean, sort of happening fast, and then Dorian Gray's took longer, um, and I'm, I may have misheard the, the last part. Can you, can you say it again? Oh, I, I, I'm just uh, commenting that it, it appears, uh, from your examples, that uh, uh, this, uh, you know, de dealing with uh, uh, self-identity, seem concerned with conserving uh, self-identity uh, over, you know, different time scales, from short to long, uh, you know, despite, you know, challenges to one's identity, which may be, you know, acute, uh, which certainly Greg or Zanza, you know, right. experience, and or, or long term. It is with Dorian Gray, although Dorian Gray really didn't care. You know, um, what he had to do his portrait. Yeah, I, I think, uh, I mean, I think there is certain kind of, I mean, for certain kind of work that, that we're all doing, whether this is kind of an explicit work that you have to sort of always keep track of who you are, you know, kind of explicitly. I don't think, I don't think that's, that's always what's going on, but I think as, 
in the Western society, at least, we are in the habit of telling particular kinds of stories, making sure that we uphold our values and so on. And this all, in our educational system, is based on kind of the idea that there is some kind of progress to a person. Um, so I think there is. I mean, I agree that there is both personally and socially a lot of work going into maintaining identity. And I think, you know, so, I mean, if, if you dig into the psychological continuity theory, which Parfit defends, I mean, you will see that uh, well, you, you'll see an example of that kind of work being, being done. Um, I think I'm John, and then Jeff. Uh, just, I'm, I'm curious about uh, different sorts of thought experiments and uh, I'm not sure the range of thought experiments you, you've looked at besides uh, purpose. Uh, you did mention like, the Prince and the Cobbler case. I'm just curious if you've uh, thought about, about that one or whether your model helps us to understand whether that's a useful experiment in any way or not. Yeah, I think, I think with respect to uh, yeah, I think what I'm saying is related to um, the Prince and the Cobra case. Um, it would be different, of course, because we don't have the two competitors in, in that case, but we do have um, a transfer of psychology case, and I would say that, well, Locke, for example, says we would all, we all, I think the quote is, we all see that this person is prince in the new body of the cobbler. I mean, it, I think actually it would depend maybe on the, on the background circumstances and what else is going on. So, I, I, I mean, I, I don't think... Um, I would suggest a similar kind of approach here. I mean, let's, let's talk about the details of what else is surrounding. Would we, in fact, all see that this is the same person as the prior person, um, would we think that this is an illusion? Um, as Maria suggested at the beginning, right, you know, how do we classify this as a genuine transfer of psychology rather than the cobbler waking up and saying, saying something delusional? And that would depend on the kind of circumstances that are surrounding this, um, um, this case, I think. Because in some case, we would be tempted to say that this is a delusion. And I think that, I mean, whether there is a fact of the matter, I mean, I, mean, I uh, that's a that's a deep question, but but I think I'm suggesting the same kind of work in that case too. It's just the results may be not as um, we may conclude that such case is possible, and it would kind of um, be the kind of person we w we would recognize as the same person as the past. It would depend on the society that's. Um, in which in which that happens, yeah. Yeah, it doesn't necessarily seem. It seems like it would be easier to fill in the details of the sort of social picture. Yeah. Right? Have the kind of immediate breakdown. Yeah, in, yeah. In the perfect case, but then it, it uh, again, how you sort of specify the details of exactly what the thought experiment is. It could be. I mean, if you have this sort of thing happening all over the place, then right. Break down, you know, so. Yeah, yeah, but 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 I think. So, uh, you pointing out the the fact that you know what if it c happened massively? Would we in fact maintain the kinds of um, practices that we have? And I doubt that we would if, if if it weren't kind of predictable or regularized or something like this, right? But then but then these are all additional details we may want to consider before we say that um, sort of lock thought experiment works like this rather than like that. Um, but I think you are right that the story would be different than, and it wouldn't have the immediate kind of breakdown that I'm suggesting uh, in the fishing case. Thanks. Um, Jeff? I'm just wondering, uh, you, you, um, it seems like thought experiments or hypotheticals are used in all kinds of philosophizing, not just about itself, but like John Rawls or political philosophy or um, right. ethical hypotheticals. Yes. Is there, in philosophy, a general objection to thought experiments of all sorts? And then you're offering what might be a way of thinking about thought 
experiments of all sorts, or this is just a particular problem to do with the kind of metaphysics and person, yeah. uh, and your solution is also just specific to that wing of philosophy. Thanks. Uh, I, you know, I'm focusing strictly on the, you know, the, I have a narrow focus on the philosophy of personal identity. I have received such a question before, and <clears throat> it, um, I think in some cases in ethics, those cases are not, um, those cases are what's called hypothetical rather than um, uh, what I'm describing, because some of them can in fact be performed. Maybe you're thinking of something like the trolley cases where you have you have a train going on one track, there are five people, and you know you see that it's going to kill five people, but then you can you know turn turn it to the right. there's another person there you know what what's the right thing to do um, in this case it's um, it doesn't have the fantastic element to it i mean it's it's a terrible thing to do uh, to imagine um, but you know whether my 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 method would apply it there or not I, I'm not sure because the details are basically there, right? The details are that you know this can actually happen. Um, John Rawls, I'm not I'm not so sure. So I want to say that there is suspicion overall about thought experiments, but I think in some cases it's more dramatic than in others. Uh, I I have to I have, I have to think more about the ethics cases because I think. You know, I think in some of them we would need more details than in others, but they would be of a different kind. And yeah, that's all I want to say. There's a there is a philosopher Raymond Gaeta who thinks that contemplating such horrible ethical dilemmas is actually bad for your soul in in, in the way that even thinking about it actually changes you into a person who could possibly think such things. So. Um, so these are different worries I'm just mentioning because I've been thinking about it. But but to answer your question, uh, I'm focusing on narrow stuff, uh, narrowly. But I will I'll be happy to do more in the future. <laughs> Alex, have a glass of wine, and then <laughs> please join us at a reception uh, outside in the main room. Thanks again. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Suspicion. I think that it's just. I think at the end, I just kind of ram rambling a little. I like the way I like her. She's a good shape. Well, uh, let's, really let's go there. Yeah, I was going to say. Crisis. Crisis. I think you put your. I mean, it stinks. You have to figure out. You know, some philosophy is supposed to. I mean, it's a perpetual crisis. But I think you put your immediate space where we're, you know, talking about how things are the hour and the shift and all Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Whatever. Well, I mean, it does sound. Like